Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Harvest Fellowship. Did y'all know that God is great? Like, like all the time, right? And all the time he is great. Is that right? We have an incredible God. In fact, in the Bible, more than one place, it says nothing is impossible for him. I really like that. You should highlight that in your Bible. Nothing is impossible for him. He is a great God. And he pours out his love upon us. I hope that you got a little bit of the the love poured out on you while we were worshiping this morning, okay? Is that when we're, when we're in the presence of God, when we're praising him, be very open to the Holy Spirit shedding abroad his love upon our hearts, okay? He likes to do that. That's our God. Okay. We are, oh, by the way, we are going to be having a baptism here pretty soon. I don't have an exact date yet, but I'm meeting with a couple different people about it. So if you're interested, go ahead and let me know, and we'll try to get all those, uh, all that together there. So, but I don't have an exact date, but maybe like three, four weeks we'll do, be doing a baptism, all right? So, uh, so just let me know. Actually, i got to make sure I'm here. Okay, anyway, yeah, so we're going on that fishing trip coming up here. That's going to be a blast. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We love you so much. You have given us a little bit uh, of uh, a taste of your goodness, and it's, it's overwhelming at times. Uh, sorry for wasting it so often, but thank you so much for the love that you pour out upon us. Help us to love you more and more because you're so incredible, so wonderful, so loving. And let it affect us, please. Let the love come in and affect us and help us to be loving people. Thank you, Lord. Teach us now from your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 3, page 989 in the Bibles that we give away. So if you don't have a Bible, just raise your hand. Someone will bring you one. It's our gift to you. We're going through 1 Corinthians verse by verse, and we've been talking about the spiritual gifts, and this is the center of the spiritual gifts passage, but this passage is all about love. Okay, let me read something from Francis Schaeffer. You know I love the dead guys, right? Okay. Francis Schaeffer's dead. He died in my hometown, Rochester. Yeah, yeah. All the famous people die in my hometown. <laughs> they, they, they have a... T-shirt there, Rochester, Minnesota, where all the sick people go. <laughs> anyway, okay, you sidetracked me there. Let's <laughs> I want to read from his book, The Mark of the Christian. He says this, Through the centuries, men have displayed many different symbols to show that they are Christians. They have worn marks in the lapels of their coats, hung chains about their necks, even had special haircuts. Of course, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with any of this if one feels it is his calling. But there is a much better sign. A mark that has not been thought up just as a matter of expediency for use on some special occasion or in some special era. It is a universal mark that is to last through all the ages of the church until Jesus comes back. What is this mark? At the close of his ministry, Jesus looks forward to his death on the cross, the open tomb, and the ascension. Knowing that he is about to leave, Jesus prepares his disciples for what is to come. It is here that he makes clear what will be the distinguishing mark of the Christian. And this is in John chapter 13, 33 through 35. He quotes, Little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, where I go you cannot come. So now I say to you a new commandment I give unto you, 
that you love one another as I have loved you. And you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And so we see here this incredible love, that love is the true mark of the Christian. Now, the great chapter of love, chapter 13, how many of you had at least a portion of this chapter read at your wedding there, at least you might remember, okay? It is the wedding chapter, isn't it? Okay, and that's perfectly okay. I do believe that's a secondary understanding of the chapter is on love, what is love, and so marital love, etc. But the context here is the spiritual gifts. So here we see sandwiched in between chapter 12 and chapter 14, which are all about the spiritual gifts, he's saying love is central to that. In fact, he segues into it, if you skip back to chapter uh, 12, the last part of the last verse, he says, I will show you an even better way. And here is the way that we see in our passage. Let's look at our passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. If I speak human or angelic tongues, but do not have love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so that I can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give away all my possessions, and if I give over my body in order to boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Now remember, he's talking to the Corinthians. And he's making this point. Gifts without love is useless. That's his point here. Remember, they were arguing about the spiritual gifts. They were arguing about how the spiritual gifts that they had made them super spiritual. Okay? And he's addressing that here. The gifts are the way we build each other up and reach out to the world. Uh, in fact, uh, look at Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23. Here, Sermon on the Mount, just at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, verses 21, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name? Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. Now look at what he's saying here. These are people who, and these are the more supernatural gifts that he's mentioning here. These are people who prophesy in the name of Jesus, who it says they cast out demons in the name of Jesus and did miracles in the name of Jesus, and yet they were not believers. He doesn't say, but you lost your salvation. He says, you, I never knew you. It's possible to, be, to have these gifts be used in these gifts and not even be a believer. So how could the gifts be the sign of spirituality? They're not. No, the point he's making here is love is the mark of a true Christian. And he goes through here back in, in our passage, and he brings out some of the gifts. He brings out the first gift that the Corinthians were uh, needing some help with, and that's why he wrote this, especially chapter 14. They were... Uh, making some mistakes with this particular gift. But he says here, if I speak human or angelic tongues but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Okay? Now, he's, he brings out how 
Tongues are human languages. They are languages, okay? He even suggests it could be an angelic language. I'm not sure what that means. I don't know if they have different languages or whatever. But we do know it's a language. And uh, if we had Etienne able to give up, I might even ask you to do this when I get to chapter 14, to tell us what all languages have in common to make it an actual language, okay? Because it's not gibberish. It's not just dabba 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 do or something like that, okay? <laughs> This is, and I don't want to make fun of it because I love the gift of tongues, actually. But, but the point is it's a language, and, and he says here how important that is, but without love, it's just noise. That's what he says. Uh, Gardner says speaking in tongues without love is just a lot of noise. The Corinthians thought that tongues was evidence of spiritual status, and Paul is correcting them gently here. In fact, if you skip over to chapter 14, verses 6 through 12, just this section, he kind of uses some of the same illustration here. He says, so now, brothers and sisters, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I speak to you with a revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? Even lifeless instruments that produce sounds, whether flute or harp, if they don't make a distinction in the notes, how will what is played on the flute or harp be recognized? In fact, if the bugle makes an unclear sound, who will prepare for battle? In the same way, unless you use your tongue for intelligible speech, how will what is spoken be known? For you will be speaking into the air." There are doubtless many different kinds of languages in the world. See, it's a language. None is without meaning. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker will be a foreigner to me. So also you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, which is a good thing, seek to excel in building up the church. Love, this is how we put love with tongues. Love thinks of others first. Love seeks to build up others. If there's an interpretation, that's going to build up others. But if not, it just builds yourself up. Motive is critical here. Motive. We're going to see that in all of these. Okay, so we see tongues. We'll talk more, a lot more about tongues when we get to chapter 14. Then we have Prophecies, mysteries, knowledge, and faith. He kind of puts them all together. Those are all really cool ones, right? Verse 2, if I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. Now, he's obviously exaggerating here, isn't he? He is, we know that, because later on he goes on to say in the very same chapter, I don't have all knowledge. He's just saying, if I had all knowledge, if I spoke mysteries and prophecies and had faith to be able to move a mountain, you know, in uh, Matthew 17, 20, where it says, Jesus said, if you have enough, the faith of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, hey, move over to there, and it'll move you, right? You know that passage? Okay. I lived in Colorado for five years, and I loved the mountains. But I actually like the people in Minnesota a lot better. So I thought, wouldn't it be nice to have a mountain from Colorado? They got plenty, okay? A mountain from Colorado, bring it to Minnesota. I haven't seen it happen yet, okay? And maybe you're saying, well, your, your faith isn't even as big as a mustard seed, and you're probably right in that particular instance here. But, but he's making the point. He's obviously exaggerating because nobody just moves mountains. That would be the motive. Why do you want a mountain? Because I like mountains. You know, I mean, that's not really the best reason to do that, right? Okay. But so it's, it's an illustration, though, of cancer. God, please. Take that cancer out of that person. Get it out, please, God. And, and so he says, if I have these prophecies, mysteries, knowledge, and even faith to move mountains, uh, but have not love, it's nothing. Um, 
Now, by the way, just as a sidetrack there, with the, as far as Matthew uh, 17, 20, uh, also in other passages, um, John 14, 12 through 14, that's a passage where it says, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. You've heard that, right? Okay, and, and so we have these kinds of passages. I think Matthew 7, 7 says, ask, seek, knock, those passages, right? Okay, and so we're just looking at those, and it kind of almost sounds like, hey, if I just do that, I get what I want, right? Okay, whereas then we have 1 John 5, 14 through 15 that says, if you ask anything according to my will, I will do it. And, and if you read that passage, it actually sounds very, very similar to the other passages. So are these contradicting each other? And the answer is no. You see, back in the ancient times, they understood what was being said here. They didn't think Jesus was just saying, hey, just ask whatever you want. And if you want a mountain move, boom, it goes. They didn't think that. They knew it was under his authority. To say or ask something in the name of Jesus is to come under the authority of Jesus. So it's the same thing as asking in accordance to his will. Okay? And so uh, the passages don't contradict to each other, but they do encourage us. You see, sometimes... We don't know what to ask for. And so we ask, right? Lord, do this. Sometimes when we're asking, and this is what I hope is going to happen tonight, as we're asking, some are going to sense, I think God wants to do this. So you get that further word and then look out. He's going to do it, okay? When, uh, and so, and, and, so we pray, and we pray in line with this. We want to make sure that we don't falter on one side where we say, I don't think he's ever going to do anything. Okay? At the same time, let him be Lord. It's, you know, if he sees fit to wait, etc., that's okay, right? So it's the now and not yet of the kingdom. But in all of this, it's motive. Once again, why are you praying? Other passages, Jesus, he, he had compassion. His heart went out to these people, and he was like, oh, and then he healed them. Are you praying because you want to see something cool happen? Or because you want to be, look at me, I healed the sick. Or whatever other reason other than this person's hurting Please, Lord, make them well. And remember that God's people, we can all be used like that, right? So we see here, he brings this up about those things. And then he goes on, give up in everything. He says uh, in verse 3, and if I give away all my possessions, and if I give over my body in order to boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Now, there's some manuscript uh, differences. Those of you who are in my class this morning, you're going to, you know, jump on this one, okay? Some manuscripts say, give my body to burn. Some manuscripts say, give my body to boast, okay? Um, I'm not going to, you know, ask me in class, and I'll tell you the, the reasons why some go one way and some go the other. But they're both saying the same thing, aren't they? If I give up my whole life, if I give up everything, is it possible to sacrifice your life for someone else without love? Apparently, right? Motive. Motive. Is it because of love? Look at Psalm 51, verse 6. Psalm 51, by the way, is a marvelous passage. If you sinned and need to know how to repent, Psalm 51 is David repenting of his sin with Bathsheba. And it is a beautiful psalm that gives us some of the parameters on how we can pray to God in that, re in that regard. But there's a curious little verse stuck in the middle here, verse 6, that I want to read. Look at what it says. It says, Surely you desire integrity in the inner self, 
and you teach me wisdom deep within. Both of those words mean deep in there, inside, in my heart, motive. It's all about the heart. Does it stem from a heart of love or does it stem from anything else? Love is the mark of a Christian. You see, in looking at this whole passage, gifts without love reduces you to noise, to be nothing, and to gain nothing, according to this passage. We dare not miss that. That's the whole point. Because then, And that brings up the question, though, what is love, doesn't it? Okay. Now, next week, we're going to see, he's going to say, here's what love does. All right? Here's what love does in action. So we're going to see love in action. But I want us to know now, what does the author mean by love? Because I don't know if you've ever watched um, Hallmark. Sometimes I'm questioning whether they really have an accurate understanding of love. But maybe they do, you know. Every single movie is the same thing. Ah. Anyway, okay. But they're all nice, aren't they? Aren't they all nice? Yeah, okay. All right, so let me help us, help us to understand here. And my point is the world is not the best at helping us understand what love is. In the Hebrew and in the Greek, I'm going to give you three words here, okay? What is love? We have ahav, chesed, and agape. The two are, the first two are Hebrew. The last one is Greek. There are several, four major words, five actually, of Greek that, that refer to love. But to the, mo- the most important one there is agape. But let me share with you a little bit about these words, okay? Ahav, in the Hebrew, that's almost more of a generic term for love, but it's love where you delight in. This is the kind of love that human beings love each other. They delight in each other. Now, chesed, that word is used for God's love for us. It's the most often used word for God's love when it, when it refers to that, okay? And chesed means loyal love. It's covenantal love where God, when he makes a covenant with you, if you have repented of your sins and placed your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior outwardly expressing that in baptism, if you have covenanted with God what we call the new covenant, okay, that's the loyal love. God will honor that covenant. We, we sang about it this morning. God will honor that covenant. He is, a lo- he is loyal to that covenant love. So there's covenant love. And then agape. Now, this is kind of an interesting word because it was a word in first century Greek that wasn't used very often. So the Christians, for all intents and purposes, adopted it and breathed new meaning into it. And the new meaning that they breathed into it was unconditional love. I don't love you because, I don't love you if, I just love you, period. And that's how you can even love your enemies, etc. It is unconditional love. You put all these three together, though, and you have... A love where we delight in, we are loyal to, and it's an unconditional love for God and for each other, right? Okay? So thus, the passage here in 1 Corinthians 13. Love is the chief of the affections. Now, the word affection, you probably don't use it too often. You probably use emotions. Is that correct? I'm not talking about emotions. The Puritans understood the difference between affections and emotions. The emotions were the little fluttering on the skin that you feel. The affections were the deep-seated wow that you experience, okay? And love was the chief affection. The opposite of that was hate. Those are the two major affections, love and hate. But love, far more than just a feeling, far more than just, you know, I'm hooked on a feeling. Anybody remember that song? Okay. 
okay. No, okay. The Puritans understood this so well, and so did the New Testament writers. In Philippians 1, 8, Paul uses the word uh, affection. Uh, in the Greek, it's splankna. Okay, it's hard to say. Splunkna, okay. What's really fascinating in the Old Testament, okay, most of you, most the, the time when it's translated is translated heart, and you think it's heart. Lev is the Hebrew word for heart. But most of the time it's not heart. It's kidneys. Kidneys were seen as the, the, the deep center of the affections of the heart. Okay, uh, it's, it's, so the kidneys, in fact, in the Old Testament sacrifice is kind of f f uh, fascinating to me. Okay, have you ever read those in Leviticus? You chop up the animal and you put parts here, parts there, okay. The parts you burned that you offered to God was always the fat and the fatty lobe of the liver, so just that little top part, and the kidneys, he always liked the kidneys. Isn't that something? Okay. So, so there's that. But the affections, and that's just their way of saying this is what we mean. For us today, we typically say the heart. But we mean some deep down true affections of love and joy, etc. So now I want to read some passages of Scripture, and I want you to feel some of these affections, okay? So please... Let all guards down, okay? We're reading scripture, so it can't hurt you. And, uh, and just listen to these, how the authors of the Psalms talked to God. Psalm 63, verses 1 through 8. This is a beautiful, beautiful psalm. 63. It's a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. So he's, he's hiding from Saul, he's trying to get him. Look what he says here, Psalm 63. God, you are my God. I eagerly seek you. I thirst for you. My body faints for you. In a land that is dry, desolate, and without water. So I gaze on you in the sanctuary to see your strength and your glory. Now he's talking about corporate worship in the sanctuary. My lips will glorify you because your faithful love, that's chesed, your faithful love is better than life. So I will bless you as long as I live. At your name, I will lift up my hands. This is biblical. Right there, right? This is, this is biblical, okay? Out of his love, he just couldn't help it. I will lift my hands. You satisfy me as with rich Food. Now, in the Hebrew, it's literally fat and fatness. <laughs> okay? You satisfy me as with fat and fatness. Yes. You know a good steak that, that has like a, like a, a vein of fat in there, and then you, you cook it just... Yeah, that's what we're talking about here. Okay. All right. All right. My mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I think of you, as I lie on my bed, I meditate on you during the night watches because you are my helper. Here we're entering into private worship. I will rejoice in the shadow of your wings. I will follow close to you. Your right hand holds on to me. David. Look at Psalm 73, verses 25 and 26. A psalm of Asaph here. So a different guy. Now, Psalm 73 is wrestling with the whole question of why do the, the sinners seem to be getting away with murder, and he's, and, he's, and he's just struggling with this until he enters in the presence of God. We see that in verse 17. And then he's able to make this incredible statement here, verse 25. Who do I have in heaven but you? And I desire nothing on earth but you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart, my portion forever. Clearly exaggeration. 
He does have a desire for other people, etc. But in comparison to his relationship with God, who is his portion, is everything. Wow. Everything else is secondary. Um, this particular passage, in, uh, I'm going to talk about this. Uh, well, I'll just talk about it now. This particular passage is what uh, the the Puritans used in their Westminster Catechism. You ever heard of the Westminster Catechism? A few of you, okay. Well, the Westminster Catech Catechisms basically are little instruction manuals that you help people understand a few things. You, know, you, you learn, here's the question, here's the answer. We train our kids, but even adults, you know, to kind of have some of the basics of the faith. They're actually really good, and they've been used for centuries and centuries and centuries by the church, okay? Well, the Westminster Catechism was the, the, uh, the Puritans used that and they start out with this one question, the first question of all. What is the chief end of man? Okay. Now, what that means is, to translate it into modern English, <laughs> what's the main purpose for us? Why are we here? What is the chief purpose for humans? Why am I on this planet? What is the chief end of man? Now, what's beautiful is the answer. He says he starts out, they, the catechism starts out to glorify God, which is great. In fact, if you study the reformers and their catechisms, the earlier reformers before the Puritans, they all, without exception, said to glorify God and just stopped there. Because in Isaiah, it specifically says, I was created to glorify God. And that is a perfectly acceptable answer, okay? But the Puritans, because they had a Affections for God. They loved God. They didn't just know about him. They were just in rapture in his presence in love with him. And they added something. They said the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Wow. To enjoy him, to delight in him. Their affections were stirred to truly love God. And you might wonder, where did they get that from the Bible? Because believe it or not, they have commentaries on their catechisms. Which is actually, I mean, to be honest, it's actually pretty fast. I've read all, you know, I've read all these things, okay, because I just love this stuff, okay. Well, anyway, commentaries, they explain this, okay, they, and they show the Bible passages. This is the passage they use. Whom have I in heaven but you? You're my everything, God. I delight in you. Of course, that's the reason for my existence, to love you, to delight in you. Because, and they would explain this in there. They would say, when you glorify God, the best way you can glorify God is if you, if you glorify him while enjoying him, okay? Because you could just praise God, couldn't you? Praise you, Lord. <laughs> but if it is from the depths of your heart where you are just madly in love with him, you're just like, praise you, Lord. God gets more glory. You see that? To glorify and enjoy him forever. That's from this passage here and others. Look at another one. Look at 43, verses 3 and 4. He says, send your light and your truth. Now, this is very important to start out here with, okay? Send your light and your truth because your affections can be swayed in the wrong direction, can't they? Right? Utterly important we get this. Got to have the truth to keep, make sure our affections aren't in the right arena. Okay? So send forth, send your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain, to your dwelling place. And here's where they're going to lead you. Then I will come to the altar of God, to God my greatest joy. I'll praise you with a liar, God, my God. When the truth leads you to the true God, it's easy to say you are my greatest joy. 
when you love your spouse, you don't just say, I love you. Oh, by the way, I told you at our wedding, I love you. If things change, I'll let you know. <laughs> no. Mm -mm. When, when your spouse hears you because they sense it, they see it from your heart, I love you. And they see that and they get that. He really does. And, and isn't that good? That's God too. He wants us to love him. Let me read Thomas Vincent, another Puritan dead guy. Um, he, uh, his book, oh boy, The True Christian's Love to the Unseen Christ, gold. This, uh, he starts out and he gives this definition of love. I'll just read the first part. Concerning the love which true Christians bear unto this unseen Christ, love is the going forth of the hearts unto the object beloved. And the love which true Christians bear unto Jesus Christ is a grace wrought by the Spirit in their hearts, whereby upon discovering and believing apprehensions of Christ's infinite loveliness and excellency, his matchless love, grace, and mercy, their hearts go forth towards him in earnest desires after union to him and communion with him, wherein they take chief complacency, this is accompanied with a yielding and dedication of themselves unto his will and service. But you see, when they get a glimpse of God's goodness, of his glory, and they get a taste of his goodness and love, it draws them to where they've got to have more of you, God. I want to be in your presence where I can say, you are my greatest joy. This is what love is. This is why it's so much more important than the spiritual gifts. Now, we're going to get back to the gifts. They're absolutely critical. Critical in our service to God. Critical in bringing about the kingdom of God. Absolutely essential. But we can't miss it. He stuck chapter 13 in between chapter 12 and chapter 14. We've got to know love before any of the rest of it is right, okay? Love is the end goal. Love is the end goal. You know the passage of Scripture in Mark chapter 12 where the... A uh, person comes up to him and asks him, what is the, the greatest commandment of all? And he quotes the Shema, and he says, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? To love God, that's the greatest command of all. That's it. That's the chief goal. Look at Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. Oops, too far. Galatians 6.10. And this helps us. This is going to remind us of what Jesus had already said that we quoted from Francis Schaeffer. It says here, verse 6.10, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us work for the good of all, especially for those who belong to the household of faith. Remember that passage in John 13. He said, They will know we are Christians by our love for one another not just by our love. Not just because you're nice to them. No, 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 no. The passage does not say that. It does not say they will know we are Christians by our love for them. It says they will know we are Christians by our love for one another. When they see that, that agape love, when they see that koinonia taking place, when, when all of us are just really deeply caring for each other, loving each other, delighting each other, when they see that, Surely, these people are real. That's what he's saying here. Especially those who belong to the household of faith. And of course, we love the world. We want to reach them for Christ so that they could become a part of the family. We want a bigger family, don't we? Okay, so because as many as possible, but love is the end goal, and this makes this important, the priority of the soul. The soul, that's in what I'm referring to that at, at least, is the, the, the mind, the heart, and the will. Uh, better, the mind, the affections, and the will. 
the soul. There's a priority in all these. So I'm going to read to you R.C. Sproul. Okay. He's dead, so I can read him. (laughs) R.C. Sproul, he says this. There is a primacy of the mind in the Christian faith. There is also a primacy of the heart in the Christian faith. Surely that paradoxical declaration sounds like a contradiction. How can there be two primacies? Something must be ultimately prime. Of course, we cannot have two different primacies at the same time and in the same relationship. When I speak of two different primacies, I mean with respect to two different matters. Okay, that's your philosophical stuff. Now get to the meat here. With respect to the primacy of importance, the heart is first. If I have correct doctrine in my head, but no love for Christ in my heart, I have missed the kingdom of God. It is infinitely more important that my heart be right before God than that my theology be impeccably correct. However, for my heart to be right, there is a primacy of the intellect in terms of order. Nothing can be in my heart that is not first in my head. How can I love a God or a Jesus about whom I understand nothing? Indeed, the more I come to understand the character of God, the greater is my capacity to love him. Not necessarily to love him, but the greater the capacity is there. The more we get to know the real God, the more capacity we have to love him. So we have to have, we have, to have the truth, but that's a means to an end. The end is to love God and love each other. Okay? Um, that's what Sproul is saying. I, I like to add that third one, the will, the actions. There is a primacy there of immediacy. This world is not going to last much longer. We need to get out there and share the gospel with unbelievers. Okay? So that is critical. But it's all true. Feed my mind with his word. Let it move my heart to love him and love others. And then get out and do the work that God has called me to do as I discover my spiritual gifts, etc. Okay? Remember, 1 Corinthians 13 is in between chapter 12 and chapter 14. And by the way, in heaven, we will love God and each other forever. Oh, man, is it going to be good. We won't get to witness, though. Okay? There's work to be done while we're here, but oh, please don't just do the work. <laughs> Fall in love with him. Uh, I know some people don't like that phrase, fall in love. I, I suppose it's a choice and whatever, but still love him. Okay? You hear me? Let me show you how to love him. One last dead guy. Okay? <laughs> Thomas Boston. He says this, there is a perfect enjoyment of God in heaven when this world is no more. This consists in, number one, an intimate presence with him in glory. Psalm 16, 111, in his presence is fullness of joy, and at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. That's in the Bible. God himself shall be with them and they shall ever be with the Lord enjoying his glorious presence brought near to his throne and standing before him where he shows his inconceivable glory. Number two, in seeing him as he is, 1 John 3 verse 2, they shall have a full, a satisfying and never ending sight of God and of all his glorious perfections and excellencies and they shall be ravished with the view thereof forever. Don't you love the way he writes? I do. (laughs) Where was I? Let's see here. (laughs) I lost my place. Uh, There we are. Number three, in a perfect union with him, Revelation 21, 3, he will be their God. They were united to God in Christ here by the spirit and faith and made partakers of a divine nature, but then only in part. But in heaven, they shall perfectly partake of it. There shall be a most close and intimate union between God and them. God shall be in them and they in God in the way of a glorious and most perfect union never to be dissolved. 
Number four, in an immediate, full, free, and comfortable communion with him, infinitely superior to all the communion they ever had with him in this world and which no mortal can suitably describe. Lastly, in full joy and satisfaction resulting from these things forever, Matthew 25, 21. The presence and enjoyment of God and the Lamb shall satisfy them with pleasures forevermore. They shall swim forever in an ocean of joy, and every object they see shall fill them with the most ecstatic joy, which shall be ever fresh and new to them though all through all the ages of eternity." The gifts of the Spirit are to be used to advance the kingdom of God by building up the church and reaching out to the world. They are a means to an end, which is to help people glorify, enjoy, and love God together forever. That's what we want to do. The gifts without love are nothing. Let's pray. Hmm. I would invite you to be open to God pouring out his love upon your heart right now as we sing this last song. If we could all stand. And I want you to be open to him just ravishing you with his love that you would experience his presence in a new way that is glorious as we praise him remember we don't focus on ourselves we focus on him but as we praise him be open to him giving you those glimpses of his glory and those tastes of his goodness come come Lord fall upon us now and we will worship you. Let's sing.
love of Jesus, love of every love the best. Tis an ocean vast of blessing. Tis a heaven sweet of rest. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus for my hand of heaven is here. As we were singing, I, I thought about um, some of you as you rise up in the morning and you have kids that are clamoring for attention and you're wondering, how can I experience this repose, this rest, this joy, this grace? A uh, couple things that came to my mind. Get up a little earlier. <laughs> but second... There's a thing that's uh, called practicing the presence of God. So even in the midst of our daily activities, washing pots and pans, whatever it might be, as you just be still and practice, you know God is here, right? Amen. He's everywhere, so you know he's right there next to you, so you just practice. You're here, God. Thank you. In the midst of the cries and screams and shattering glass and everything else, you know. <laughs> You're here, and he will take a little bit of his love and put it in your soul, and oh, man, is it good. It's good enough to get you through, okay? It really is. May God bless each of you. We're going to have people up here ready to pray for you, too. If you need prayer, we're going to be gathering together tonight to pray, okay, for you. So if you need prayer, please take advantage of that here. Take advantage of it tonight. But may God bless you. I pray that he will bless you, especially this week, with more and more experiential encounters of his love, that it would fill you like that, that ocean of love. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.